Welcome once again to the Christian Home and Family Podcast. My name is Kerry Green, and this episode is the third installment in a set of messages I gave at a recent marriage retreat. This one is about connection or unity as a couple. Now, once again, as in the past episodes, there were some technical difficulties that we ran into, but the content is good enough. I encourage you to listen. Let's spend some time praying here before we begin. Father, thanks for the skit that illustrates in a lighthearted way some of the struggles that we have in understanding each other. Men think like men and women think like women, and sometimes never the two shall meet, it feels. But the work is, is made easier, made lighter with your help. Thank you for that. We ask you, Lord, to just enrich us tonight. There's many things that you have to teach us. We trust your spirit to be our teacher. Lord, this is your evening. This is your word we're going to be looking into, so we ask you to illuminate it. We ask that in Jesus' name, amen. Our tonight, we're going to be talking about connection, and I would like to start off with asking for your feedback right away. But just a few of you sharing, when you first married, what were your hopes that prompted you to get married? So in other words, what were the things you were hoping for in marriage? A best friend. Okay, good. A companion to enjoy doing things with. Someone, a companion, someone to enjoy doing things with. I didn't hear it. I like to be together. I'll be together. Okay, similar things. Good. A lifelong partner. Lifelong partner. Okay. Ah, someone to share an empty nest with. Well, you've accomplished that goal, huh? Yeah. I never thought about that when I was beginning. Yeah. We have a lot of hopes at the beginning, don't we? I'm just thinking, you know, we, we have some friends who are similar to VJ and Becky who had an arranged marriage. And even though it's arranged, you still have hopes. You still have desires for what you're hoping this relationship would be like. It's a little different than the Western version, but it's, it's the same kind of thing with anticipation and desire. And I think it's human nature to want the best you can have in that relationship. And there's many different versions, I think, of the why behind our marriage, you know, why we actually decided this is the right person or this is who I should marry. And so in all of it, I think if you hear the answers that were spoken, there was this element of connection in there, wanting a best friend, wanting a lifelong partner, wanting someone to share good experiences with. That's all about connection. It's wanting to be known by someone else and to know someone else and to to be accepted in that knowing, which I think for most of us is probably the real big deal. We want to be accepted and loved and cared for. And I think the connection, as much as it's a big deal to us, it's a big deal to God, too. I mean, he so loved the world, he gave his only son. He wanted to reconnect with. And that's his motivation behind all of that. And it's that desire for connection, I think, that keeps us moving forward in marriage. It keeps us persevering. It keeps us striving for more. And when that gets frustrated... In my experience, that's when we go for books and we go to counseling and we go to some wise person we know who has a marriage we admire and try to get help because we want to get that back on track. We want to we want to move in the right direction. So tonight I want to look at four passages, four different passages that, don't, again, don't specifically have to do with marriage, but they have to do with what it looks like for us to relate to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And... Husband and wife who are both Christ followers are brother and sister in Christ before they're, Christ, they're, they're husband and wife. So these definitely apply. I want to read through all four passages real quickly, and then we'll go back and kind of dig through each one a little bit and see what is there. First one is 1 Peter 3, 8 through 9. He says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. 
Next is Ephesians 3, 20 through 4, 1, or through 4, 5. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Then 1 Peter 1, 8 through 11. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then the last one is Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And when you read a series of instructions like that, that are filled with such idealistic sounding uh, commands, what, what do you draw out of them? What do you hear being said about the way we are to behave within the Christian church toward one another? Keep that in mind. These are all Christians. This is how you should deal with other Christians. What are the things that you hear being said, the kinds of things? Humility is a big one. Unity. Unity. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Love. Thankfulness. Thankfulness. Patience. I think we all could probably raise our hand and say, I'm not very good at most of those. Much of the time, uh, we get so embroiled in our own perspective and way of living and hurry of life that we find these hard to even fit in. And I think what we're being told here is these aren't to be fit in. These are the, the manner in which everything is to be done. You know, these are the color and flavor, every interaction, every relationship. And I think because these lists can sound so hard, so impossible, they're, you know, something we've struggled with, we sometimes get into a mindset where we settle for less than God intends. We give ourselves excuses we justify, we rationalize why we're not doing such and such. And in fact, as we talked about this morning, we actually have the power source within us to pull this off. But because we've tried so hard in our own strength for so long, we've convinced ourselves, eh, I'm doing good, I'm doing okay, it's good enough the way it is. Rather than pressing forward to strive for these idealistic sounding things. And so what I'd like to do is walk back through the passages a little more slowly, look at each one of them a little more in depth, to see what it is that Paul tells us or Peter tells us makes these possible. And I think the answer is right there in the passages. But before we do, let's remember the foundation that we've already laid. First, our commitment to Christ as individuals needs to be in place. Secondly, our communication is the means that brings us together as a couple to attain the goals we're aiming for. And now we're going to look at the practical outcome in daily life. 
And that's the connection that we all hoped for when we first got married, being carried out in our marriage. So let's look at 1 Peter 3, 8 through 9. What is your calling? This is how Peter says it. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. So I look at some of the things he says there. He says, have this mind. So he's giving us a command. Think this way. Do not do this. You know, he fills in the blank. Bless. I mean, these are, these are intentional words. They're commands given to us, instructions that we're to carry out. But look at the underlying reason. And this is what blew my mind when I was digging into this passage. He says, to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. And so as I was pondering that, I'm saying, wait a minute. He's giving us instructions and he's somehow connecting it to a blessing we're to receive. How does that jive? Where do those fit together? And what what just dawned on me as I'm looking at this is that the instructions he's giving are the means to obtaining the blessing. When you live this way, you are blessed. You receive blessing. Your partner receives blessing. The people you're interacting with. So real quickly, let me just go through the, the list and then I have a question for you. Unity of mind. What happens if we diligently pursue unity instead of giving up? Just ponder that for a moment. Sympathy. What happens if we get in the other person's shoes in order to understand them? Brotherly love. What happens if we truly love, if we truly put the other's best interests first? Tenderheartedness. What happens if we extend compassion instead of criticism? Humble mind. What happens if we exalt the other person? instead of ourselves. No paybacks. He says, do not pay back evil for evil. What happens if we leave vengeance to God and we just keep loving, we keep serving? And then he says, bless. What happens if we actively seek to be a blessing? Let's turn it around for a minute. You tell me, how do you respond when you're treated in those ways? And this is not a rhetorical question. How do you respond when someone treats you so well? Yeah, you, you're grateful, you re- respond. You respond in kind. Anyone else, how do you respond when you're treated so well? Like I don't deserve it. Like you don't deserve it? You feel humbled? You feel humbled? And wanting to reciprocate. Okay, so humbled and reciprocative. Is that the word, reciprocative? I'm making up stuff as I go. I'm making this stuff up. Someone else was saying your defenses drop. Good. Yeah. 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 So it, it, yeah, it starts. It starts making this give and take, back and forth sort of a. I'm going to say it again. Reciprocative um, <laughs> way of of interacting. Say it again. Put an S on the end, and I think you. Reciprocatives. Ness. Ness. Oh, you said Ness. I thought you said an S. I was, Reciprocativeness. I don't know. Yeah. In America, what we do, we're reciprocativeness. Um, yeah. <laughs> but as I think about this, I mean, doesn't it, doesn't it kind of make sense when you think of it that way? When we're treated in these ways, we respond well. We respond appreciatively. We respond in a way that wants to bless and not curse, as he says. And so we flip it back the way he intends it, and he says, you are to be this way. You're to be the instigator as a believer in Christ. You're to be the one who starts the ball rolling in relationship. And we've had situations in our marriage, situations counseling couples where, you know, they've been at odds for so long. They're sitting there just... Just butting heads, but yeah, but you, and yeah, but you, and she does this, and he does this. At some point, you have to call a timeout, and you say, somebody has to go first. Somebody has to become humble first and start serving, start loving, start forgiving. You know, all these things that we read in these passages, somebody's got to go first. And Paul's answer, or Peter's answer, rather, is 
you all go first. All of you. When we were first married, Mindy's aunt gave us this advice on our, the night of our, our wedding rehearsal. You know, everybody's sitting around giving advice to the new couple. Her aunt said, her husband's name is Rusty. She said, if I concentrate on serving Rusty and meeting his needs, and he concentrates on serving me and meeting my needs, nobody's needs go unmet. And that still just echoes in my mind. That's part of what Peter's describing. He's saying if we're all working to be who we are to be in Christ, that's the means that brings the blessing. That's the thing that brings about what we're all hoping for. This connection, and this, this unity that is ours in Christ. And I think when we look at it that way, and then step aside and look at how our culture portrays marriage, and you hear all the snide remarks about men and women. I mean, the skit kind of illustrated it for us, you know. We start seeing, we adapt that mindset sometimes because of our experience, rather than standing contrary to it and saying, no, that's not a good marriage. This is a good marriage. I'm going to live out the truth. I'm going to serve my spouse. I'm going to be the one to go first. Because I want the blessing. I mean, in a sense, it's a selfish thing, but it's also a giving thing because your spouse won't get it if you don't get it. You both got to be giving. You both got to be a part of that that whole thing. And we forget, I think, that we're called to obtain a blessing. Is that uncomfortable for you? To say, I'm, I'm called to obtain a blessing? That's my calling? Really? Yes. I mean, I, I think sometimes we've been taught in the church, you know, if it's ever self-serving, ooh, that's, you shouldn't be going for that. You should always be concerned about giving to others. Well, yes, but, it's God's economy that turns around and blesses. That's the means that brings you goodness at the same time. And God says, you are called for that. I intend you to have that as my people. You know, are we to be like Christ, laying down our life for the lost? Absolutely. Are we, be, we to be doing that for each other? Absolutely. And there's a lot of cost to that, a lot of pain and suffering at times. But in that economy, blessing comes. Blessing comes. It's an amazing thing that God set it up that way. Let's look at the next main heading there, living worthy of our calling. So Peter tells us about the calling, and now Paul in Ephesians tells us about living worthy of that calling. I'll read it again. It says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And now he's going to describe it. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There is a manner of living that is worthy of the calling we've received. There's a manner of living worthy of the gospel, is what he's telling us. And it's said another way, God's plan to redeem us has a here and now effect in the way we live. Our living is to be affected by the fact that he has changed us. He's called us. He's put us into this world as his ambassadors. And the words Paul uses is humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with, loving, unified, being at peace. It's really amazing when you think about it. Paul says, because of what you receive, because of the transformation God has worked in your life, this is who you are. It's your identity. We talked about identity a little bit yesterday. This is your identity. You are this person. And I think we do ourselves a disservice and we do our spouses a disservice when we think, oh, that's so hard for me. Or I can't do that. You see, we're, we're calling, this is going to get hard because of the way language works, but we're calling ourselves by personal pronouns that aren't accurate. We're saying it's hard for me. No, me is the renewed guy, not the old guy. Me, it's not hard for. My new identity, that it's, this is Christ. Christ is my life. It's easy for him. This is how he lives. And when we get stuck thinking I'm the old sinful fallen guy, we get stuck in, in, in a dysfunctional pattern. We, we quit realizing the resource is there for us. But it is. He's saying this is who you are. This is the manner worthy of your calling. And as I mentioned this morning with the bullet point lists, he's writing it all out to remind us, this is what it looks like. 
when you're walking in the Spirit. This is what it looks like when you're interacting with a brother or sister in Christ in a way worthy of the gospel. This is what it looks like. So use it like a warning light on the dash. When, you get, when you're feeling impatient, when you're feeling proud, when you're feeling, it's like, oh, time out. I've got to do a self-check. I've got to, I got to change my attitude right now and take on the, the attitude of Christ Jesus. And then in verse 4, he stops listing the manner of living and starts listing why it's possible. He's saying, first of all, you're one body. So the truth behind that is we are already united. Jesus has done that. So even if we're in the most heated argument as husband and wife, we're not on different sides. We're not against each other. We're still on the same team. And for me, that helps to think, I'm not against you. Why would I be against you? You're my sister in Christ. You know, we are heading toward the same goal. We are united by one spirit, by God's spirit. We are, even in the midst of the conflict, we are united. We are headed toward the same goal, that consistent calling of God. We do have one and the same Lord. We're utilizing the same faith in Him. We've all been baptized into Him through faith in His death. And we have the same divine power living in us. Man, in the midst of an argument, those are great things to be reminded of. We're on the same team. We're siblings of the King of Kings. We're children of the Most High God. Why is this argument such a thing that we would allow to become divisive? That's ridiculous. Why would we let the enemy get that foothold? I remember you mentioning this morning, the enemy, man, he's right there, isn't he? He's right in the middle of it, wanting to drive a wedge. And this reminded me of uh, something Peter wrote. He says, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Some versions say, for life and godliness, through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he's given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. There's another brain cell just popped right there. What? Wait, I'm participating in the divine nature when I'm letting Christ live through me like this? That's incredible. And yet that's our calling. That's what he's, he's told us we are. That's who we are. And we're going to see this reiterated in the other passages that we've already read that we're about to dig into. That we are not on our own to live out this calling. It's not just husband and wife gritting their teeth trying to eke it out. God is in the midst of it. It's really a relationship of three people. Let's look at the next heading. Gifts from God to make it a reality. 1 Peter 1, 8 through 11. He says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. You hear that encouragement to not give up? Keep loving each other earnestly. Since love covers a multitude of sins, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. He gives us two examples of the priorities that we're to have toward one another. He calls them earnest to love and hospitality. And he gives us one reason that we can expect those to be possible. And that's that we are all, as followers of Christ, gifted by God to pull that off. Do you think of your spouse in those terms, that they're gifted by God? And I don't just mean in their smarts or in what they do for a living or in their talent at some skill. I'm talking about supernaturally gifted by God. Do you think of your spouse that way very often? It's important. And it's important that we don't, I love one of the things, you know, the DWI thing. I love that. Discounting the woman's intuition. I think sometimes we discount our spouse's gifts because they're not our gifts. We don't see them real clearly. We don't get how that's helpful. We don't understand where they're coming from. And so we discount it. It's not as important because I don't understand it or because it's not the way I see it. And I think as we begin to learn 
that our spouses are uniquely spiritually gifted by God. They have insights God has given them that I don't have. We're able to, we're able to receive this blessing more. We're able to live more in unity and harmony. I can tell you about Mindy. Uh, I learned really quickly. Mindy has a gift of what we have come to call exhortation. She is real sharp to see black and white in a situation, not in a judgmental way, but in a, in a real accurate way. She can see what's right and what's wrong in attitudes and in the way people are talking. And if you're close enough to her, and sometimes if you're not, she'll call you on it. She'll say, hey, wait a minute. I think, and she'll spell it out. And when I first married this wonderful woman, ooh, I was so defensive I stunk. And man, that was a hard, hard, hard season of life because I'd get my back up and I'd want to fight. And I'd, how dare you say that about me? You know, and I don't think I ever used the words, how dare you, but that's how I felt, you know. But thank God, you know, Christ in me provides this humility of mind so that I can take the time to see, you know, she's absolutely right. And my problem is I've lived for, what was it, 21 years when we got married. I've lived for 21 years without anybody ever calling me on my junk. And now somebody who's gifted to see it is calling me on it. And that's a gift to me. That's a gift. And I think sometimes our spouse's gifts rub us the wrong way because they're not our gifts. Peter's point here of us being gifted just makes this whole thing possible. He's given us supernatural empowerment from the Spirit of God to work together. We have received unique gifts. And he says they are to be used to serve one another. Have you thought of your gifts that way? That the spiritual gifts you have are to serve your spouse, to serve your children, whether they're still at home or grown? Our spiritual gifts are to be used by God to serve. That's the purpose. And then he says, as good stewards of God's very grace. This one blows me away. We think all the time about God's grace, God giving his grace to us. But I think we forget quite often one of God's favorite channels or means of grace is people. He gives us his grace through other people. And when we use our gifts effectively and we use them with an attitude of service, we are a channel of God's grace to that person. I mean, can you think of a better reciprocative way of blessing your spouse than to be a channel of God's grace? And I, I tend to think of grace not just as, as some airy supernatural thing. I think of it, of it as help. God's grace is his help to me. And he gives it through my spouse much of the time. And then he says we're to use them in the confidence of faith. Did you catch that? In verse 11, he says, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. I mean, if you're gifted to speak or you're gifted to teach, he's saying you should do so with authority. You should do so confidently because you're not because you trust yourself, because you trust God gave me this gift. God will speak. And then he says another example there where he says, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So in other words, whatever way it is you're serving, you don't allow yourself to get overwhelmed. You don't allow yourself to say, this is too big for me. Instead, you're saying, God's giving me the strength. I can do this because he's called me to it. And those are just two examples. I mean, we've seen the list, list of spiritual gifts, right? There's 12 or 15 or 20, depending on how you read the list. Whatever your gift is, he's saying, do it with faith. Use it with, with confidence because it's God doing it through you as a channel of his grace. You know, at the end of life, he says the outcome is that God gets the glory in all of this. And when we lay our heads down in death, when we're lying on our deathbed, when we're aging and can see the end in sight, what else in life is really going to matter? then whether or not our life brought glory to God, what's really going to matter? It's not going to be the money we made. It's not going to be the degrees on the wall. It's not going to be the, be the nice house or the car or the clothes. It's going to be what he says here. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. And we get to be a part of that. It's not that God needs our glory. 
but it's that the entire cosmos gets to see God more glorious by the fact that he can use broken, fallen people like us. I just, I'm staggered by that. That my life can actually somehow magnify God's amazing self. I don't know a better way to say it. And I love how John Piper talks about this. He, he says, there's two kinds of magnification. There's the magnification of a microscope and the magnification of a telescope. We don't magnify God like a microscope. We don't take something small and make it large so that we can see it. We take something massive and draw it close so others can see it. That's how we magnify God. That's the kind of glory we give to him. We make him look bigger in people's eyes than they're able to see at the moment. And we can do that for our spouses through the use of our gifts. I just find this such a humbling thing. It's an incredible privilege to be able to not only magnify God through the use of gifts that he's given, but to bless my spouse at the same time. That's like a win-win. I can't think of it getting any better than that. So let me ask you a question. What could be different in your relationship with your spouse if you saw your gifts as God's means of grace to love and equip your spouse? (coughs) Think about that for a minute. I'd love to hear what you think about that. Let me say it again. What could be different if you saw your gifts as God's means of grace to love and equip your spouse? Yeah, yeah. So your interest is in them thriving, them becoming successful as a, as a follower of Christ. Yeah, that's a good word. And you're blessed. And then, you're blessed. Yeah, and then you're blessed. Yeah. Better together. You're better together. Yeah. I mean, think about it. If your spouse thrives, aren't you going to thrive? Yeah. And then the two together make an even better package. That's a great... A great thought. I think that's very insightful. I mean, it's hard to encourage someone if you don't know exactly where they need encouragement. You know, Because I've found that in, in areas of gifting are often the times where we have our greatest doubt. You know, we, we, we do it and we think we're good at it, but we're not sure. And we need someone who cares about us enough to say, that, I mean, you hit a home run right there. That was amazing what God did through you. And Mind I interject, we should always say what God did through you. The glory goes back to him all the time. You know, but there's a there's an encouragement in that anyway, because it tells the person you're God's channel, you're God's means of grace to these people when you did that. That was that was beautiful. Um, I remember Larry Crabb years ago wrote this book. I think it's in, in his book called Connecting, ironically. I didn't even think about that. Um But he talks about delighting in people. And the way he defined delighting was drawing Christ out of them for them to see. So so saying, I'm I'm objective here. I'm observing what you just said, what you just did. And I saw Christ right here. And when you did this, and here's what it looked like. He, He says, that's delighting in them. That's, you know, kind of reveling in God's goodness through them. And then bringing it out for them to see. Because we don't see ourselves objectively, do we? We hardly ever. We're so skewed in our perspective. It's so good to have a, a loving partner in your corner, right? Who will tell you, man, that was great, what you just did. And it, and it helps us, I think, grow in faith and grow in confidence. Someone else, what could be different if you saw your gifts as God's means of grace to love and equip your spouse? Christ. Yeah. yeah. But I was just thinking that I have definitely have the gift of administration and he's an evangelist. Mm. And so thinking when you're talking, it's like, you know, by me giving my gift to do all the financial stuff at the house, that frees him up to be able to be sharing the gospel. Mm. Mm. Yeah. That's great. Sometimes they're not real flashy looking partnerships, are they? No. <laughs> Sometimes it's doing something as simply as organizing things, mm-hmm. keeping the household running well, 
so that there's less stress and less conflict and less clutter, you know, whatever. Sometimes the partnership is very simple by appearances, but it's a magnifying effect. Anybody else have something on your mind you want to share? Sure. But it brings joy to me when I see a gift being displayed. Through VJ. Yes. That huh. helps me. Huh. Not just, you know, not, yeah. It, of course it is, you know, I, I, I have to benefit out of it. Yeah. But when I benefit out of his willingness to help, I am greatly thrilled by that. And yeah. that definitely makes me happy and eventually makes him happy. Yeah. He's a happy wife. Oh. A happy wife. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad there's not a good rhyme for husband. You know? <laughs> we, could, we could make our own version. Uh, I so appreciate Doug does everything about the cars. I get in, I turn that key, <laughs> I expect that sucker to start and take me where I want to go. He watches the gas gauge for me because Aww. that's not something I really care about much. <laughs> other than if it's it not going. Yes. Yeah. And so, and he keeps the cars washed. He does all of that and worries about the, not worries about, but keeps track of the warranties and all of that stuff that I couldn't care less about. But and if he didn't, you'd care. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he watched, you know, I mean, even down to watching how much tread is left on the tires and he replaces the tires so that yeah. we're safe. And I just deeply appreciate him doing all that because I just run the wheels off of it. And when it quit, I'd be mad. <laughs> <laughs> I do think, I think um, that most of us here have been married quite a long time. And um, you just sit here and you say, I would be on the streets very quickly. I don't do any of those things. I don't. I don't do the clock radio in our room. <laughs> you know, and I. I'm like, how do you do that? I have no, <laughs> no intention to know. You know, and the computer, please. You know, I'll be hiring a teenager. Craig takes care of all those things. Yeah. And I mean, and we um, become unappreciative because that's just assumed. Yeah, that's assumed that that's his, yeah. that that's their portion of the marriage. You know, I made dinner. Yeah, you know. Yeah, but that that we just we take it for granted. We don't see that as expressing of their gifts. Yeah, there's an old saying that I think is a little too strong, but I think we all get what it means. Familiarity breeds contempt, mm -hmm. and I think it's saying what you're saying. You you start assuming things. And if it's not done up to your expectations, this contempt starts to grow. This anger starts to grow. And I think your point's well taken. We gotta we gotta learn to notice those little things and be great, be thankful. Someone highlighted from the passage earlier. Be thankful. Let, let's be thankful. And I was also Let's thinking see. that um, I treat people at church often with more respect hmm. in a business like manner, in a sense. Hmm. But because I'm familiar with Craig, I will badmouth him. Mm. You know, where I would never say that to a fellow brother, sister in Christ. My husband. Yeah. And he gets it all, you know. And I went on that church, I don't yeah. I try not to. It's embarrassing to have to <laughs> <laughs> call my parents and tell them what I did. <laughs> but you know, we, we yeah. at church we won't we won't do that to each other. But how we will do that to our co-heir in Christ that we live with. Yeah. Well, that's well said. Yeah. Why, why do we do that? That's, sorry. We always, that's, yeah, we do that. Yeah, but that's, yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, this will, I'm about to kind of do it. This will surprise you all, but Mike is a man of quite a lot of confidence. But, <laughs> that is, that's a gift of his. It really, really is. Yeah. And I appreciate that gift in him, even though I joke about it and we joke about the humility is his best quality and you know, all of that. But then there are those moments in life 
or something will just blindside him and knock him down. And I hope that I have been good to come alongside him and, yeah. and lift him up and encourage him and whatever. And that brings me happiness that, you know, he's often encouraging me because I do not have as much confidence as he does. I do not always, you know, feel like my path is blazed out you know, quite the way his is. And so, you know, when I can help lift him back up again and get him back on that track, it is that blessing. I, I am blessed by that. And I'm blessed that, that, is, that I can see that as his gift. Mm -hmm. That's great. Right there underneath the question, I've got a resource li listed. Um, this book called Practicing Affirmation by Sam Crabtree is an amazing book. Um, it's a short read, but just packed with great practical um, advice on how to really practice affirmation. And that link will take you to a place where you can get the first chapter for free. And then obviously they want you to buy the book, but um, it, the first chapter is worth it. He, he kind of outlines his mentality about what it means to be uh, a person who affirms well. And so anyway, just a resource for you. Let's go on to the next heading. Your identity guides your outlook. This is Colossians 3, 12 through 17. <clears throat> Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing song, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The first three words he uses to describe us, chosen, holy, and beloved. I have found in my interaction with believers and even thinking about those things for myself, those are hard truths to accept, strangely enough. To, to accept that God picked me, God chose me, that, I, that he sees me and he says, holy. That he looks on me and says, he's my beloved. I mean, I think all of us have a certain amount of insecurity or self-doubt that we hear those things. And we go, really? Can that really be true? That that's how God thinks about me? But Paul makes the point here. That's the basis of all this stuff. That's who you are. You are chosen. You are holy. You are beloved. Your identity is what guides your outlook about all these things. I remember hearing a story uh, a long time ago, back when JFK was president. Uh, John Kennedy, you know, little John Kennedy, they called him John John, would basically had the run of the White House. He would just, it sounds almost like he was a terror in a way, but he, he, would, he would walk through the hall, walk past Secret Service agents, walk past Marine guards, and walk right into the Oval Office in the middle of a meeting because he knew who his daddy was, you know? And he knew his daddy was going to accept him and take him up on his lap and just continue the conversation with him sitting right there. I mean, that's kind of how I picture this. We've got to see ourselves that way. We are chosen. We are holy. We are beloved. We are sons and daughters of the King of Kings. That's where all this comes from. We don't just generate this out of sheer, sheer willpower. We, we do all these things he's describing because God says that's what we are to him. We are his children. I mean, you can stop for a moment and think about your children. How do you view them? I mean, not talking about, you know, that they're perfect or anything like that, but they are beloved, aren't they? Because they're yours, because you've lived life with them. You've raised them. You see the good in them. You have such hopes for them. 
And then we transfer that to an eternal God who's absolutely perfect and has done everything to redeem us and make us who we are. And he says that about us. That's just mind-blowing. That the God of the universe thinks that way about us. And we, we have this video set from a, a, a dear couple who have gone on to be with the Lord now. Bill and Annabelle Gillum are their names. And she tells this story about their, their son, Mason, who was born with severe Down syndrome. I mean, just severe, so severe that they could not care for him. And so as a little boy, he was in a care facility 45 minutes away all the time. That's where he lived. And they would go visit him during the week, and they would bring him home some weekends and things like that. And she tells a story of he had been with them for the weekend one time, and she just didn't want to make the drive to take him back. She was just exhausted. It had been a busy weekend. And she was discouraged, you know, dealing with her handicapped son all weekend. And she just didn't want to take him back. It felt like admitting a failure or something to take him back and let someone else care for him. And she turned around and she looked at him and he's sitting in his high chair drooling and, and you know, just as happy as he can be doing his thing. And She wipes his face and she goes back to the dishes and she's just struggling with this whole thing and struggling with her worth as a mother and her her value, you know, what good am I to him and all these things. And she turned around and looked at him again and she said she could just hear the voice of God saying, Annabelle, you don't look at your son with disgust and with criticism because he's got his food all over his face. You don't look at him that way because he's yours. I don't judge you by your performance either. I judge you by the blood of my son. I judge you because you're mine. That you are mine, beloved. And she said that changed her whole world. To hear that word from the Lord. And I think we all need to hear that word from the Lord. Again and again and again. And one of the means of grace God's going to use to do it is our spouse. When we're discouraged. I love that story. When we're discouraged, when we're knocked down, whatever. But have someone in our corner who's saying, no, this is not who you are. Your son, your daughter became kings. You're, you're, you're wonderfully made. You're, you're gifted. Don't let your failure define you. Don't let the difficulty define you. That's not who you are. I tell you, in the times of my life when I know Mindy is in my corner, and I can do anything. That's how I feel. I can just conquer the world because she believes in me. She sees in me who God's made me to be. And that, that's what matters in my heart. Um, I look at this, I think about um, in, in precept, K. Arthur always says that there's a therefore. Mm -hmm. You ask yourself, what is What's it there for? for? Yeah. And so I reworded this. So God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, that's what you mean. And therefore, we should have mm -hmm. compassionate hearts, kindness, yeah. humility, and meekness. Yeah, that's the basis for it all. Yeah, very good, Nita. I like that. <clears throat> Now, let me ask you this. It's kind of a personal introspection kind of a question. When you hear those three words, chosen, holy, and beloved, which of those three is hardest for you to accept as being true of you? Holy. Holy, holy. holy. yeah. Why is that? What, what connotation? What's that? Sometimes there's things that aren't holy. Yeah, because we do things that aren't holy. Okay, so you're defining yourself by your action right. rather than by your identity. Exactly. Okay. That's not the truth. Right. Someone else said something. I usually think of holy as what is reserved as a, a meaning for Jesus Christ, God, and Spirit. Okay. So it feels uncomfortable because it feels almost blasphemous. Like I'm taking yeah. something that's related to him. Yeah, because that's where you put it. Yeah. He's the holy one. Right, right. You know, okay, good. Yeah, and we and we know ourselves to be sinners, sure. Sure. It's helped me to think of an alternate meaning of the word holy as pure. Mm -hmm. That's been very helpful. To think God calls me pure. And I can easily relate to that, you know, because the blood of Christ covers my sin. It washes it all the way, you know, past, present, future. So you get to the the thing I did that was unholy. Well, it's covered. It's covered. God's already dealt with that. 
and we beat ourselves up over it. And he's going, eh. We need to take Martin Luther's advice. He said often, um, your guilt only uh, sh- should only serve you long enough to drive you to the cross. And once you're there, its job is done. You know, but we just continue beating on ourselves with our guilt. And it just doesn't serve us. It doesn't serve the gospel at all. Um, we were talking with someone today who's got a hard time believing they're beloved by God because the family they grew up in didn't express love. In fact, expressed the exact opposite. You know, criticism and guilting and all that kind of stuff. And so now to think of God loving them, it's just overwhelming. You know, he, he doesn't know what to do with that. He wants it, but doesn't know what to do with it. And so he defines himself as, I don't know how to love. I don't know how to receive love. And, it, and again, it's back to what he feels rather than what God says is true. God says, you are beloved. You are. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. It is who you are. Now here, let's flip the question on the other side. Which is most difficult for you to accept as true of your spouse? Holy, beloved, or chosen? And you don't have to answer this one out loud. But just think about it. <coughs> is there a way in which you don't accept the fullness of your spouse's identity in Christ? Sometimes it's just those little constant irritations, you know, that uh, I hate it when he does that. I hate it when she does that. And we define them by that rather than, okay, let's, let me get my eyes on who they really are. And then maybe we could deal with this constructively or in a way that's affirming or encouraging. I think it's interesting here um, in this passage He really says that because God has made us his children, we're to actively bear the family likeness. Did you catch that? How he says, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, this is what you're to look like. This is what God's kids look like. We have on very rare occasions, but sometimes when we've felt it's helpful, said to our kids, you need to be this way with this friend or in this situation because you're a green this is how we are. These are family standards. This is who we are, you know. And like I said, it's on very rare occasions because that's not really the point. We want them to be children of the king, primarily. But I hear Paul saying here, you're one of the king's kids. Represent him well. Be who you are. Things like compassionate hearts and kindness and humility and meekness. Patience or bearing with people is one way he says it. Forgiving, loving. Then he also says there are certain things that we are to let be true of us. Did you notice that? All throughout the the passage he says, let this happen, let this happen. Let me find him here. Um, Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. So it's almost like we resist it or we're, we're opposing it somehow in our normal way of living. He says, Uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So the implication is those things are already true of you. They're already existing in your your being, in your relationships as believers in Christ. Let it flow. Don't restrict that. Let it happen. I've appreciated um, in years past when I looked at this passage that on Mm -hmm. Sure. You don't have to necessarily feel all these things. Yeah. Kind of like you said, you, you put it on, you do it. This is who you are. Yeah. And then, you know, feelings can come or go. Yeah. But you, you put it on, you act that way. You know, it's not fake. He's telling you to put it on. Almost like putting on clothes. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've heard it said that way before, and what, what even pushed it a little further for me was to think of it as he has bought us a royal wardrobe, and he's placed it all in our closet for us. And he's saying, put it on. Every morning, get up and put it on. You know, put on peace, love, kindness, gentleness, the things that he's saying here. And it's like it's already yours. It's like the money in the bank account I mentioned yesterday. 
It's already yours. Use it. You know, get going with that. There are, there are also, I notice here, certain actions that we take in light of our identity. Things like teaching one another, admonishing one another. Boy, that one's touchy, isn't it? Um, and I think in both of those, especially teaching and admonishing, humility is required. You know, you, you, you have to be humble to be a teacher or an admonisher, and you also have to be humble to receive teaching or admonishment. It's a two-way street. It goes both ways. Um, and then he says, we are, there's another action. We're to express our joy and thankfulness, he says, in song, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, the old King James says. Um, and I think what that's about is, I mean, if you think about worship, does God need us to tell him who he is? Does he need us to express gratitude? He doesn't need any of that. Why do we do it? We do it, I think, primarily for ourselves. We're reminding ourselves who he is. And I think what he's saying here is when God supplies these blessings through these means he's prescribed, we're to let that well up in joy and sing it out. And I don't know about you, but music for me just has this power of reaffirming things in my life, reaffirming truths and solidifying them in my mind. And, and I think Paul is tapping into that here where he says, sing and make melody about these things, you know? And it kind of sounds like he's saying, do it together. You know, he's writing to a group of believers. And that's, that's really a lot of the reason we sing is to encourage ourselves in the Lord, remind ourselves who he is. Because I, I use this phrase all the time and I actually got it from a business guy a long time ago. But we leak. Do you know that? We leak truth. We leak encouragement. We leak confidence. I mean, they just leak out all the time. And we have to keep filling them up. We have to keep refilling the tank. And I think for me, truth is one of those things that's most, it, it leaks the most. I don't know why it is. These kinds of truths. You're holy. You're beloved. You're, you're chosen. You know, we forget those. And I think it's probably because... Yeah, the world we live in, the stress we feel, the the failures we have, we start to define ourselves by what we see, you know, living by sight rather than by faith. Yeah, and Satan, sure. Yeah, Satan doesn't want us to know all these things. Not at all. And then finally he says, do everything. Paul's not a guy to mince words here. Do everything in the name of Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. So we take all these things and we, we say, okay, I want to uh, actively bear the family likeness toward my spouse. I want to let these things be true of me for the sake of my spouse. I want to do these certain actions toward my spouse. I want to do everything in the name of Jesus for my spouse's sake. We go, go back to what we talked about earlier, that, that consider others more important than yourself. It all just, I love how scripture, you know, Ephesians, 1 Peter, you know, they all just weave together when you get into them all. They all, they all support and, and fit together really, really well. So back to our original question for this session. When we decided to get married, what were the hopes that prompted us to make the decision? It was connection. It was being with someone who's for us and we're for them and we're going to spend life together. We're going to navigate the ups and downs together. And I think going through passages like this and seeing not only the commands but the power to fulfill the commands encourages me. It's not only possible, God intends it. That's what he wants a Christian marriage to look like. It's for us to be fleshing this out, not only with each other, but toward each other. So, let's look at the assignment. Find some time to sit down and have a conversation with your spouse using these scriptures. And I left that kind of vague because there's a whole lot of words 
on the page in those four passages. So just pick what resonated with you and say, I really liked this. I really felt God was speaking to me in this. And then, as we talked about this morning in communication, take time to listen. Understand what resonated with them. Um, Hear where each other's at in that. Um, Express to them the kind of connection you desire to have. So in other words, say, I want us to be connected like this and describe it. This is how it looks to me. How does it look to you? You know, not what it is, but what you want it to be. What you think God wants it to be. Have that kind of a conversation. Um, And then express to them how and where you see these truths expressed in their life. So get into the affirmation part. Here's what I see in you. Here's what I love about how God uses you. Here's what I love about how he uses you to help me. I mean, those kinds of things. And then these last two may or may not apply. But if confession's needed, confess bad attitudes, confess wrong that you've done toward each other, and ask for forgiveness where needed. And if you're on the other side of that, grant forgiveness. You know, we're not to hold resentment or bitterness or those kinds of things. Um, This may be one of the most lengthy assignments. I mean, it may take longer to get through all of this. So I'd encourage you to find the time to do this before tomorrow, or I guess it didn't have to be before tomorrow. Tomorrow's, my understanding is tomorrow's more kind of like a church service, right? We're going to just worship. And so, yeah, so my message is a little shorter and it's, I wouldn't say it's off topic, but it's a little, a little different. So this won't necessarily connect to that. So if you need to do this in the drive home tomorrow, that would be a good time or when you get home or whatever, but we encourage you to, to do that assignment. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for these truths that are laid out for us. And I continue to be astounded and overwhelmed by what you say about us. You say that you picked us. I remember being on the playground and always wanting to be picked. Um And when you were toward the end of the line of being picked, it was always discouraging. And here we we have it that the king of the universe has picked us. And we all know better than to think that it has anything to do with us. It has to do with the overwhelming nature of your love. Your compassion is great and your grace is sufficient. And we... Love and appreciate that, Lord, and want to be your chosen ones, holy and beloved. And we ask you to show us how those things are true. And I think more importantly for daily living, show us how to believe they are true of us. And show us how to believe they are true of our spouse and to treat them that way. I mean, it's it's funny, Um, Lord, I... I hadn't thought about this till right now, but I, okay, let's just stop the prayer for a minute because I got to tell you this. Lord, <laughs> Lord knows this, so I don't need to say it in a prayer, but um, I have two daughters who are at marrying age, all right? And there's guys who ask them out here and there and that kind of thing. Um, I'm real serious about that as a dad. <laughs> you know, you want your daughter to get a good guy. You, you know, they're, they're like a treasure. They're, and, and I think about, that kind of thing with this, it just now dawned on me that if, if we can view our spouses as God's daughter or God's son that he's protective of and treat them in light of that, how we behave toward them, man, that could just transform all kinds of things. Just, and I think of that passage in Peter where it says, um, husbands live with your wives in an understanding way. And he says, if you do not, your prayers will be hindered. It's kind of that sentiment. You know, God's saying, this is my daughter. You don't live with her rightly. We got a beef, guy. And I think we should see each other that way. Our spouses are God's children. How would we want to treat the king's kid? Anyway, back to the prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that. And thank you for just the richness of your word, how applicable it is for wherever we are, wherever we are in life. And I just thank you for this group of people open hearts and willingness and diligence and pray your greatest blessing on them and ask that you'd give us a great rest tonight and a great opportunity tomorrow morning to just worship together and, and focus on you. In Jesus name.
Jesus' name.